I am so conservative. I rationalize in my head. These are things I read. And I'm going to talk about Willow Creek. Okay. Uh, Willow Creek, a few years back, had invited... I remembered invited... at the time when Will Rogers said, I, I don't belong to any organized religion. I'm a Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> I am so conservative. If you didn't jump to conclusions, you might not get any exercise. I am so conservative. I... And welcome to the Unknown Webcast. This is just a bit of a trigger warning for those who believe words are more injurious than sticks and stones. I really am so conservative, I can't turn left even when I'm driving. In addition to giving trigger warnings to our viewers, Ron Hensel and I both, that is both, drink coffee for your protection. Today, Eric Johnson from Mormonism Research Ministry joins us to talk about his latest book, Introducing Christianity to Mormons. My name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast. And our senior researcher is Ron Enzel, who will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast. And here is Ronnie Baby. Greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm tree came out, saw its shadow. And now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsor for this edition of the Unknown Webcast is the Designer Jesus Collection. No longer need your Jesus be a source of social embarrassment. Check out the new Jesus fashions at the Designer Jesus Collection. And our regular legal disclaimer, our guest on today's webcast, insert name here, that would be Eric Johnson, has no connection whatsoever to any of the satirical content of the Unknown Webcast. Here after known as the webcast, although we probably will not mention it again. This satirical content includes any and all commercials, end credits, puns, smart remarks, or anything else that might fall under the definition of satire. In the meantime, Midwest Christian Outreach Inc. bears no liability for or responsibility for anyone's opinion regarding this satirical content. Our regular announcements notice the opinions expressed on this webcast are ours and should be yours too if you really enjoy it or if it really annoys you and you want to inflict it on someone else. To ensure your continued access, please go to midwestoutreach.org. Click the yellow donate button. Click the yellow donate. There we go. Click the yellow donate button and contribute as you feel led. And never fear, this webcast is Y2K compliant. And don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite video channels. And here is where we insert the fake applause. But because we don't have fake applause, I have to fake it. <sighs> fake, fake applause. Fake applause. You know, I think I think I get more mileage out of that than if I actually spent money to get fake applause. So maybe. I'm maybe just going to so, keep maybe. doing that. Greetings, and, Eric uh, Johnson. Hey. And, and we've we added on a new channel. We now are on LinkedIn as well. So uh, That's one yeah. of your favorite video channels. <laughs> so, it could be. So, Eric, yes. you said you've been here before, so we really didn't need to tell you about the commercials, did we? You, no, we... I was already expecting those. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, but you probably weren't expecting our legal disclaimer. We we made that specifically for Marcia Montenegro. Every time she would come on and we would do these commercials or any of that, she would say, okay, I have nothing to do with that. I'm not connected to that, you know. So we, we put it right up front. You know, we got our lawyers said do we cheat them and how to draft that for us and those are good lawyers i've heard yeah <laughs> they've never I'm lost a case lost. they've lost a few clients but they've never lost a case so so um this is an important book for a couple of reasons Let's but i it. want to start out with just a little bit of a story the book is uh in fact they probably should show the book why don't yeah, i show the book well, I want to be good. Then, then, then i can see okay what does the book look like well what? here is what the book looketh the like book i'll look. use the king james there it there looketh like go. that. How do you like that? Yeah, it's a good cover. Introducing Christianity to Mormons. Eric Johnson, forward by Micah Wilder. Uh, and uh, so, that look really good on your coffee and your coffee table when you have the Mormons over. You know, I think so. There you go. <laughs> Definitely would. would you like a cup of coffee, Mister Mormon. <laughs> so I was, I was sharing before we went live uh, years ago when Joy and I started uh, reaching out to Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, we started going to conferences around 1990, 
Uh, and uh, you would have the speakers up there. I mean, love the Lord. They really want to reach all his witnesses. Uh, and they would tell their story about the methodology that they would use. And it usually ended up with something like, we have led thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses to the Lord doing this. And so we would go and learn it, and we would use it, and it wouldn't work. And we thought, okay, what are we doing wrong? And we tried that with several things. And then uh, Joy had uh, audio tapes. She loved audio tapes back in the day when audio tapes were popular, cassettes, little ones. Uh, and uh, one was by a gentleman by the name of Ed Havich. We've had him on here several times. Love Ed Havich. And he, his talk was exactly that. He said, I went to these conferences. I would learn these new methods of evangelism. I thought I was called evangelism. I would try them. I would memorize them, and they wouldn't work. And I started wondering, am I called to evangelism? And then he realized that his style is different than others. It doesn't mean the other methods are good or bad. It just means they didn't work for him necessarily, number one. Number two, God is involved in the exchange. So he calls people. We are merely there to deliver a message. We plant seeds, we water seeds, and those things. There's a lot that goes into it. One family we had led to the Lord. As it turns out, he had been a Jehovah's Witness for 35 years. She had been one for 24 years. All the kids were raised in it. His elderly Baptist aunt in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, had been praying for him every day for 35 years since he became a Jehovah's Witness. It ended up we were the answer to that prayer. She couldn't reach him, but God brought us into their lives through a series of other events. So books like this are important because it's saying, okay, there are other ways to do this and maybe stylize to a particular group of people that can be helped by this kind of a, not a technique, but a way of thinking about how to talk to someone who's a Mormon. So before we do all of that, why should anyone even listen to you? What got you involved in Mormonism? Were you ever a Mormon yourself? No, uh, uh, I, I am with Bill McKeever of Mormonism Research Ministry, MRM.org. Oh, sad, sad for you. And, he, he's, <laughs> and he's a member of your board even. So, uh, oh, he is. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, true. That's yeah, sad for us. EMNR. But um, uh, so I, I've been involved with this ministry. I met Bill in 1989. I volunteered there for a number of years. I taught... Uh, high school Bible, and I worked in the community college and also taught at the local seminary uh, for over 17 years. So uh, that's kind of what I did until 2010 when I moved to Utah to work with Bill full time in this ministry. But no, I never have been a Latter-day Saint. I actually became interested in other religions in 1978 when I was a junior in high school when there was a guy named Jim Jones who oh, took, yeah. took people down to Guyana uh, and uh, basically uh, gave them cyanide Kool-Aid to drink. And that's where the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid comes from. And I, as a junior who grew up in a Christian home, asked myself, why would they do such a thing? How do I know I'm not in such a group like this? And so I really needed to own my own faith. And that was one of the things I did in the Bible department at Christian High School in El Cajon, California was teach students how to think for themselves, how to read the Bible, how to take a look at other religions and then determine what is truth and then go for that. Uh, and that kind of is a background of who I am. But this book actually, you're talking about tactics. We wrote a book back in 2018. Sean McDowell and I edited, co-edited a book with uh, 26 different um, contributors in that book called Sharing the Good News with Mormons that was published by Harvest House, as this book, Introducing Christianity to Mormons, is. Th that has all the tactics. This, is, What I'm going to be doing here in this book is not so much a tactic, but more it's how to share Christianity, which everybody ought to be able to do as a Christian, but to right. be able to do it specifically to someone from a Mormon worldview. So it, it's going to be a much broader approach than what we shared in that book, I wrote a chapter on the miracle of forgiveness, uh, a book that was uh, produced by the, um, Spencer W. Kimball, who at the time was an apostle of the LDS Church and later became president. That's a very, that's a narrow tactic, and that's a particular way. Uh, and I would never claim that you're gonna you're gonna get thousands of people to be able to become Christians through a book like this that I've just written. But what it will do is it's going to help you to communicate the basic fundamental truths of what Christianity teaches and help the Latter-day Saint to eliminate those straw men arguments that are oftentimes used 
to say, I don't believe in your religion because blank, because you guys believe that grace, all you have to do is go f up front at a church, wave your hand and say, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I can go and sin and do what I want. Or the Trinity is a three headed God and so forth. So I'm hoping that we'll get rid of those stereotypes and those straw men, bury them and have a chance to really explain what the Bible teaches about what is true. Yeah, and I, the, the, one of the approaches I, I like, I mean, the approach I like is is kind of this. It is pretty often the case, I want to say, that when someone is trying to go out and reach someone in another group, and Mormons were talking about today, so we'll talk about Mormons, and they will walk up and say something like, you are not a Christian because you believe X. I don't know, Jesus was born on another planet to... Um, a god and one of his many Mormon wives and so forth. Now, that is what they should believe, but does that mean that is what they do believe? Uh, do you have the official line of an organization? You have that with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, with Mormons and other groups. But that doesn't mean that the individual you are talking to believes that. No, and I think that's an important point to make, Don, because we don't want to ever assume what a Latter-day Saint believes. Even in the last few years, we've seen a lot of Mormons, that's, that's their nickname, members of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, who have rejected what their leaders teach, who, who rebel against their ideas. Uh, big time in the last few years, a lot of feminists have uh, rebelled against the church as far as only being able to pray to Heavenly Father, but Heavenly Mother is not prayed to, and Heavenly Mother does play an important role in the Mormon Church. Also, the priesthood mm -hmm. is not available for uh, anyone who's uh, um, besides males uh, who are a certain age, the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods, but women can't get that, and that's another problem. Or the LGBTQ plus issue, that's huge right now. So you'll have a lot of Latter-day Saints who stay in the church, but they disagree with those kinds of issues and perhaps even some doctrines. And so you never tell a Latter-day Saint what he or she believes because that person might not believe it. But to be kind, I think we need to ask them, well, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about salvation by grace through faith? Whatever the topic is, let them tell you, but you're gonna have to listen carefully because the terms they're using are going to be the same oftentimes as to what evangelical Christians use. And so you're going to have to, when you're not sure, you have to ask the question, what do you mean when you say blank? What do you mean when you say salvation by grace? Because you believe that, I believe it, but I think we're different, but I'm not quite sure. Can you help me to better understand that? Or salvation. What do you mean when you say that we're uh, that, that salvation is for everyone? So I, I think that's the, the right thing to do, and that's going to produce more productive uh, or, conversations right or uh salvation for you and i salvation and eternal life really are synonymous or the same thing right but that's not true with mormonism is it no Mor mormonism has two types there's the general salvation uh joseph fieldney smith the 10th president called it uh, which is basically because you were righteous in a previous mm. life called the pre-existence you chose jesus and his plan of salvation over lucifer you were given a chance to take on a body and this is called mortality or the second uh, state. And so everybody who's born is going to be immortal. Uh, immortality is the idea of atonement, the atonement of Jesus and salvation by grace. Those are referring to the ability to go to one of three kingdoms of glory, the celestial or terrestrial or the telestial kingdoms. Those are three different kingdoms. All of them involve immortality. But a Latter-day Saint isn't just saved by grace. He saved by grace after all he can do. And that's right. from the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi 25, 23. So exaltation is synonymous with eternal life or the celestial kingdom being the very top level that you hope that you will be with your family forever if you keep the commandments of God in this world. And right. that is, it, is a big... At that point, you become gods or goddesses, right? Right. That's what you're hoping to do. Just like God the Father uh, once lived in another world as a human being with the body of flesh and bones, and he probably was a sinner. A lot of Latter-day Saints will admit to that. Uh, he died, but then he was righteous enough to become the God of this world. And he worshipped a God before him, and that God worshipped a God before him, infinite regression of the gods. Well, Mormonism believes, or teaches, the leaders at least do, that we have the potential to be as God, 
by keeping the commandments in the next life and going to the temple, getting married for time and eternity, learning mm-hmm. special uh, what are called tokens or handshakes that come from masonry, getting a new name that's private, quiet. You're not allowed to talk about it. But that is what is required along with your obedience to be able to have your family with you forever in the next life. And then you will continue what Heavenly Father did. You know, um, it seems you've, you've kind of indicated it's or implied, I guess, that at least among the rank and file, there has been a liberalizing trend mm-hmm. among the general population. Mm-hmm. Um one of the things that I've had difficulty understanding, and I'm, not, I'm taking us back to the 19th century when it all began, is this very broad, as you depicted it, very broad view of salvation or immortality. And yet, as I understand it, uh, at one point in the 19th century, Brigham Young taught the doctrine of blood atonement, mm-hmm. where people were actually killed. Yeah. to atone for their own sins. Now, of, I, I guess they don't, I guess they stopped at some point doing that. Uh, yeah. Why would that, how does that, why, first, why would you even new, do that if you have such a broad view of salvation? Well, because you're going to want not just the terrestrial or celestial kingdom, you want to get the celestial kingdom. And the only way to pay for certain sins, such as murder or adultery, would be to have your own blood shed. But isn't that opposite of what the Bible teaches? Because it's Jesus' blood that has the uh, efficacious atoning power to be able to cleanse somebody from their sin. But they said there are some sins that cannot be forgiven. They get it from Joseph Smith. They get it from their own scriptures. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, murder is not forgivable, according to DNC 4279. And so if you, re, if you take your standard works seriously, and Mormons do have four of them, they call them the standard works, their scripture, if you will, the Bible, the King James Version, as far as it's translated correctly, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. So in DNC 4279, when it says murder is not forgivable, what are you going to do about that? God can't do that. He's not powerful enough to do that. So that's where even un, un, until the last year or two, on our books here in Utah, if we do capital punishment, like Gary Gilmore, I think was the last that was killed back in the 1970s right, yeah. and yeah. Gil- killed with a gun uh, bullet, because why? Why would why did we have that on our books? Well, that is the idea that your blood will pour out on the ground. And because of what you had done, that's the only way you'll receive atonement, a forgiveness mm. of sin, so to speak. So the son of God's blood was insufficient, but your own personal blood is sufficient. Isn't that crazy when you think about how, I mean, how can my blood of a sinner, somebody who has done this sin, I mean, that's obviously, uh, you know, somebody who needs to have blood atonement. Uh, you know, why would why would I have to do that when it's, it can't pay for that sin? But that's not a teaching today. And I think Latter-day Saints who might be watching this are saying, oh, we don't believe that today. And that's true. But you're right. Brigham Young very much taught that. In fact, he said if a woman... Uh, was in a bed. It was in the bed and committing adultery. That you should throw a javelin through her, so that her blood would be able to atone for her sin. That was wow. the only way to redeem so, her. So they they didn't really have a choice as to which kingdom they were going to go to. <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of like it would be. It seems to me it would be nice to say, well, now you you sure you don't want to end up down in that poor celestial kingdom? Because uh, if you don't, then I'll kill you and shed yeah. your blood on the ground. But they. Yeah. It sounds like they didn't take that extra step. No, I I mean, courtesy. And here's the thing. Latter-day Saints today even cannot tell you where they're going to go when they die. They know they're going to go to one one of three kingdoms of glory because of the atonement, because of the grace of God. But if you were to press them and say, well, what about the celestial kingdom? Isn't that where godhood takes place? Exaltation, of course. Do you want to go there? Well, of course I do. Are you going to go there if you were to die? That's eternal life in Mormonism. And they say, well, probably not right now, but I'm trying. I'm doing my best. Those are the words you'll hear oftentimes from Latter-day Saints. But they cannot know that they have what 1 John 5.13 says is eternal life. The same term used for the celestial kingdom. uh, And and that's a really bothersome verse. 1 John 5.13, I've used that a lot of times with Latter-day Saints to show them that the word eternal life is used there. And yet they can't know, and that bothers them because a lot of Latter-day Saints envy what you have 
as an assurance that if I were to die right now, even though I'm a sinner, even though I still struggle with sin, Paul did as well. If you read in the middle of Romans, Romans 7, I mean, uh, th these are things that right. th that right. um, uh, the Bible teaches, but we can have a peace that passes all understanding. How can we have a peace that passes all understanding if I don't know if I'm good enough to be in the very best that God has promised for the faithful members of a church? This is right. the problem with Mormonism. So now Ron has uh, the uh, intro, the uh, contents. Uh, chapter yeah. one is uh, the Bible, God's special revelation. Now, of course, they believe the Book of Mormon is God's special revelation as well. How do you address that? And I could explain it, but I'll let you explain it. You you do address that in the in your book. Uh, in what way? Well, I mean, in, in Mormonism, uh, oftentimes you'll hear from Latter-day Saints a citation out of the Articles of Faith. There are 13 Articles of Faith that were put together by Joseph Smith. They're found in the Pearl of Great Price, one of their scriptures. And uh, Article 8 says the Bible is true as far as it is translated correctly. And, uh, and so I'm going to spend the first two chapters just trying to show that the Bible really is accurate. It, the transmission of the text is 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 uh, well researched. We know how it came to us. And when they say the Bible is true as far as it's translated correctly, they're not really referring to translation as one language to another. The Greek right. into the, the you know they're they're talking about transmission that there were corrupt priests. If you ask a Latter Day Saint, what do you mean translated correctly? Oh, there were many corrupt priests who got in there and erased and added. Well, if you take a look at the over 5,000 Greek manuscripts, the 24,000 total manuscripts, we have entire copies of the New Testament from the fourth century. We have the, uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls I talk about in chapter one that help us to see that the Old Testament is also accurate. Before, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947, all we had was the Masoretic text from earliest around the 10th century AD. And yet when we find these important documents, including the whole scroll of Isaiah, two of them found in cave one of the 11 caves in Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in Israel near the Dead Sea, you, you find out that a whole book of Isaiah written 125 BC with all the same prophecies uh, in Isaiah 53 about Jesus, uh, the same idea of how God is, is worshiped, Isaiah 43, 10, God says there's no God before or after me. Isaiah 44, 6 and 8, God doesn't know of any other gods, so on and so forth. I mean, very powerful when you take a look at what we have. But listen, if we don't have any kind of authority like the Bible, then it just becomes my mere opinion versus right. your mere opinion. Right. I have to have a standard. So, yes, I put a lot of emphasis in this because when Latter-day Saints are thinking about leaving or do leave, or even if they're in the church, so often they have a very low regard for the Bible. And when they do leave... Um, you have to really work with that to be able to set that standard or you, you're going to have to just use mere philosophy and reasoning. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there's more power, I think, in God's word. They once believed in God. They once believed that Jesus was their savior. And they even once read the Bible. Mormons right this year are reading the Old Testament as part of their curriculum. Come follow me. Uh, right now they're in they're in the uh, Psalms. Um, I mean, well, so, so they do read it, but then they do use their own proof text to be able to show what they think is true versus what historical, biblical Christianity has taught for 2,000 years. Now, in, in the process of making your case like that, one of the things I do, and, and maybe you do something similar, is I might uh, talk about that other group over there. In other words, I'm not talking about what their group teaches necessarily, but that other group over there could be Jehovah's Witnesses or could be a New Ager. Mm -hmm. uh, like the claim that uh, some evil priest went through and uh, redacted, erased, changed, yep. recopied, whatever. Uh, and uh, um, Elizabeth Montgomery, who was a fairly popular journalist, who was a New Ager, uh, made uh, this uh, claim that uh, uh, reincarnation was in the Bible and had always been in the Bible. In fact, that's why what John was talking about. Uh, in, in the book of John. And uh, some evil monks, though, took it out in the 6th century A.D. And why evil monks would take it out, we're not really sure. Uh, yeah. But what that depends on, that claim depends on something that you've already kind of laid out. 
is we have earlier text, even better text, and it still contains all of the same information, the same language. The reincarnation doesn't appear in anything no. uh, uh, prior to. And there's a lot of copies. So how would they have gone, whoever did this uh, change, uh, all over the world and found all of the copies that were hidden and dug them up and changed them and then put them back in the... Why, who would do that? Why would they do that? Where's the evidence for that? Yeah, you know, I appreciate that they said the 6th century because that can be refuted real quickly. We have three complete New Testament codices, they're called. Codex mm -hmm. Vaticanus, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Sinaiticus. And all of those came after the King James was put together uh, uh, back in 1611. So we have complete New Testament uh, yeah. scrolls, if you will. They're codices, so they're books. And we can say, okay, let's flip through here. And what I like about modern translations, and I encourage Latter-day Saints to read modern translations because they will only read normally out of the King James Version, but they don't understand it. But what I appreciate, right. about, appreciate about the modern translators, uh, in fact, I studied at seminary. I went to Bethel Seminary, San Diego, graduated in 1991, studying under two of the translators, Dr. Ronald Youngblood, Dr. Walter Wessel. And they used to tell stories of how they would do all of this and how the manuscripts they would use and how they put this all together. Uh, I find great value in being able to to uh, to look at the NIV, the ESV, all the different modern versions and look at their notes. If they were trying to hide anything, they wouldn't say some manuscripts say they wouldn't right. take out the uh the johannian uh, uh comma is called from first john chapter five which would have been a perfect uh proof text for us to use for the trinity they say right. late manuscripts say and then they add the other words that was obviously one of those occasions and that didn't happen until the 15th century uh a guy named erasmus was the one who put together yeah. uh, uh the the uh the the, the, the actual first edition words. yeah yeah the first, and, and, the first printed collated Greek New Testament. Right. Yeah. And, and so and so uh, when you go through the notes and so many times and they're blips. OK, these are not things that are earth shattering. Jesus is not God. Oh, we better take that one out and we better put in Jesus is God. You know, if, if that's what it says. John twenty twenty eight. Thomas calls Jesus God. Well, uh, he didn't really because look at this manuscript that says you're not God. No, they don't. We what? don't have anything, or that that you have uh, you you have uh, the idea that reincarnation took place. Well, somebody needs to go tell uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth whoever Montgomery. wrote the book of Hebrews. We can argue oh. over who wrote that. Hebrews nine twenty seven uh, right. says that uh, it's appointed for uh, men to die and then, then yeah. come to judgment. And Second Corinthians six two. Um, I, I mean, these are verses that very clearly teach that there is no ability to do work after this life. So so uh, it's what we call argument from silence. Yeah. An argument from silence is I can make any claim I want. Oh, all these different people who added and subtracted. Then you ask the question, well, what kind of proof do you have? Yeah. Right. Well, I read a book somewhere. So oh, I, I know there's lots of references. I do the same with Bible contradictions. They say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. You ask the question. Can you name me one? Most oftentimes, they can't name <laughs> you one. They heard somebody I, else say it. I, I was talking to uh, an apostle of the community of Christ. Uh, we were in Nauvoo a few weeks ago. Bill and I were, and we had a, a one and now, a half. Now, hour now, meeting. For, for, yeah. for the listener, for the listener. Yeah. Yeah. Community of Christ versus Mormonism. What does that mean? Community of Christ is the old, um, the the, uh, the the RLDS is the church based in Independence, Missouri, and uh, when. Brigham Young took most of the Latter-day Saints with him to Utah in 1846. Uh, um, people stayed behind, and the largest splinter group of Mormonism, of Joseph Smith, is the RLDS, now the Community of Christ. This base, this church is very New Ages today. They have a temple in Independence, uh, and so uh, they, they do not believe, really, the Book of Mormon is historical. They're very liberal. Like I say, New Age is, is how I would put them today. But they're, they still have apostles. They still have a prophet. And so one of the apostles, we had a great chance to talk to. And as, as we talked to him, um, he brought out, well, you know, the Bible's full of contradictions. And I asked that question. And so he had to think about it. And he came up with one. And I said, really? Is that the very best you have? 
is that the best? Because if I'm able to, to answer you on this, will that change your mind about how accurate the Bible was? He said, no. So I said, well, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into a deep discussion on this if it's not going to affect you at all. You, br you brought one up that I think is very weak. And uh, I, I think uh, there are whole books that Christians have written to show apparent contradictions. Of course, there are. I mean, when you're talking about uh, a, a book that's 2000 plus years old, uh, you're going to have uh, some possible discrepancies, but there's no contradictions in that kind of sense. And uh, so I, I think when we make the other person come up with the goods and we don't do that enough, or what's your contradiction or uh, what's your proof that there were things that were added in? And then I have lots of evidence and I produce some of it in this book, but I even have evidence of their own scholars back in the 1960s saying the Bible is 99 and 44 one hundredths pure. I mean, how much better can I get than that quote to say, even your own leaders say the Bible right. is trustworthy. So why do you not trust it? Right, hmm. right. And very often when I sit down and talk with someone who is a Mormon, I try to just use stuff produced by the Mormon church, as, as you do. Uh, so the, the, the quad, the four in one. And uh, when I do that, I'll ask them, okay, now you have the King James Bible in here. Can you tell me which parts are not correctly translated so we can avoid those? Right. And, <laughs> and, and I would be concerned, by the way, if they're, if they're producing a, a, an inaccurate translation, why would they do that? But that's the second point. Well, and the, and the Book of Mormon says many plain and precious truths are no longer there. But Joseph yeah. Smith actually put together uh, his version of the Bible called the Joseph Smith translation or the inspired version. It's not officially used by the church, but if you get their quad, the four together, as you mentioned, there are notes in there that come from that book. And Joseph Smith finished that in July of 1833. Uh, very yeah. clearly taught in the documentary history of the church. Uh, volume one uh, page, I think it's, uh, I forget which page it is, uh, 356 or something like that. Uh, I, I mean, uh, so so Joseph Smith supposedly fixed a lot of these problems. And, and what's great about this, I like to use the Joseph Smith translation on the streets because for the most part, he doesn't change the best parts. He doesn't change no, yeah. uh, the sure. parts about G uh, God being one God. He doesn't. Uh, mm. he, he doesn't add in a lot of his theology, which actually doesn't come until later. And then when he's writing the Doctrine and Covenants, you'll see from the earlier parts of Doctrine and Covenants change over time toward the end, where now he's teaching in a God of many, one of many gods, yeah. and uh, and a completely different version than what the Book of Mormon teaches or anything that he taught in early well, days. You know, talking about different version, there are many groups that want to have Jesus connected to what they're doing, uh, and, and they want a Jesus so that they have kind of designed for themselves. Yeah, so we have some questions, or one at least. Uh, do you cringe when the Christians you hang out with try to introduce Jesus to your non-Christian friends? Well, you can say goodbye to the days when your church's Jesus was a source of social embarrassment. Now even your church can keep pace with the latest fashion-forward trends in spirituality. Introducing the Designer Jesus Collection. These amazing new Jesus styles are hitting church runways in the most exclusive Jesus fashion shows at churches near you. You don't want to miss Yoga Jesus, <laughs> Hipster Jesus, Buddy Jesus, Socialist Jesus, Mormon Jesus, and of course, Muslim Jesus. At Designer Jesus Collection Fashion Shows, you will find a Jesus you'll be proud to introduce to your most sophisticated, cutting-edge friends and acquaintances. Please observe the attendance requirements, cost of admission, your eternal soul, required attire, semi-formal, all proceeds benefit His Royal Majesty of the Kingdom of Darkness. The Designer Jesus Collection, London, Paris, Rome, New York, Salt Lake City, and coming to a church runway near you. So it's obviously very close to you if it's in Salt Lake City. I'm going to say, and uh, is that over at Target? Can I find that over? <laughs> or, I'd like to find out where I can get well, all I'm this. i look for a church that has a runway for, you know. There you go. So, so uh, chapter three, what is chapter three all about here? Chapter three, okay. is it up there? It, Let's, it, it, John is rapidly looking for chapter the three. The exi existence of God 
uh, reasonable reasons for belief. And you might ask, okay, why in the world, Eric, did you put in a chapter about the existence of God? We're talking about talking to Mormons. Well, here's the thing. Mormons, when they leave, don't run to your Christian church. They end up running to atheism, agnosticism, or nothing at all. This book right. here, and I'm not trying to promote her book, but it's called The Next Mormons, published in 2019 by Jana Reese. She's a Mormon blogger. This is Oxford, so it's a scholarly book. She did a lot of surveys, and she asked people, did surveys of those who left the church, and I'm going to say probably is even higher today, but 45%, she said, become atheist, agnostic, or nothing at all. Another 21% remain they say we're just christian uh it, they're not going to the lds church they're not going to the christian church they're not going to any kind of spirituality they're just christian because they're moral they don't kill anybody and they're not committing adultery that means two out of three people who leave end up leaving for nothing only right. one third go to another religion and of that one third We've got Catholics and Buddhists and even evangelical Christians. In fact, evangelical Christians are the number one group they'll go to. But if you look at the whole, only 10 percent become evangelical Christians. I just right. don't think that's that's good enough. And so since I run into so many former Mormons, we have a guy here in Utah. His name is John DeLynn. He uh, runs Mormon stories. Uh, very popular. Everybody who leaves the church, they all know about John DeLynn here in Utah. And uh, he has a huge influence on on people. And so they kind of take his skepticism uh, in stride. They uh, uh, oftentimes, even if they've just left for a few months, uh, I'll ask people when they come into the Utah Lighthouse uh, bookstore run by Sandra Tanner in Salt Lake City. She has a bookstore there across the street from the ballpark in Salt Lake City. We have a lot of uh, former Latter-day Saints who will go in there to get the information she has. She has a lot of good information about the history of Mormonism and and the problems with it. And I had just a month ago, I had three couples in there at the same time, which is rare to have three. And they all, every single one had just left within the past year. So mm. I always like to ask, so where did you land? Where are you at right now? All three of them landed in the atheist camp. And, and so this is a uh, this is why I put in a chapter, because if you're talking to somebody who's either thinking of leaving or who has left, there's a really good chance they're going to be influenced by a guy like John DeLynn or Bart Ehrman or other guys like that, who you guys are very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're going to be quoting from them and talking about flying spaghetti monsters and all of that good stuff. And you're going to have to be able to say, well, I believe that God does exist. In fact, didn't you believe in God at one time? And they'll say, yeah. Didn't you believe Jesus was your Savior? Yes. But I don't anymore. I'm more sophisticated. I'm smarter now. Right. Okay, well, let's take a look at, at why I think it makes sense that we can say God does exist. This, for me, this raises a question. What I, you know, I uh, probably have more experience with refugees or people who leave other groups other than Mormonism. And what I find in my narrow experience is that the ones who end up transitioning into atheism, uh, one of the biggest reasons they did so is because of, of a profoundly negative, probably even abusive experience that they had in the group that they came out of. Uh, is that what accounts for why so many Mormons are going into atheism or is it something else? I'm going to suggest that the great apostasy plays a major role. And when they do end up leaving the church, uh, I'll ask them, I'll say, uh, you know, uh, have you heard the phrase, um, if the church isn't true, then nothing else is? That's a very common phrase said by sure. Mormons to each other to encourage themselves when maybe some hard information comes along. Well, where else are we going to turn to? to understand the great apostasy. It's the idea Mormonism teaches that after the apostles died, they did not replace themselves as they were supposed to apparently. And right. so Christianity died with its authority and it wasn't restored. That's what the word they use, restoration or restored until 1830 when Joseph Smith uh, starts this church. In 1829, he supposedly had John the Baptist visit him and he and Oliver Cowdery got the what's called the Aaronic priesthood and later Peter, James, and John visited from heaven and gave them the Melchizedek priesthood. Those are the two priesthoods that a male needs to have that Christians don't have. In fact, in their scripture, very prominently, and every Latter-day Saint knows it, Joseph Smith History, chapter 1, verse 19, which is 
found in the Pearl of Great Price, one of the four standard works. And God and Jesus appeared to Joseph Smith when he was 14 years of age in 1820, supposedly. And, G and Joseph Smith was told that all the churches were wrong. Right. All their creeds were an abomination in wow. God's sight. And all their professors were corrupt. So would you turn to any other church? Would you turn to the Christian church if you still had that belief? And so I like to mm -hmm. ask them, do you believe in the great apostasy? And oftentimes they'll say, yes, we believe yeah. in the great apostasy. I'll say, but do you believe Joseph Smith uh, properly translated the Book of Mormon? Oh, no, I think that was a fraud. Do you think that Joseph Smith was righteous in having polygamous wives? Oh, no, that was wrong. Uh, so you pretty much have rejected Mormonism. Right. Oh, yes, I don't want anything to do with the church. So why are you believing one of their fundamental teachings that the right. church, if that church right. isn't true, then nothing else is. It doesn't seem to make sense. I have had a lot of Latter-day Saints say, you know, I haven't thought about that before. Right. So well, you, and, you see this a lot with ex-cultists who are still carrying baggage. Yeah. Right. And they're not aware of it. Right. right. Oh, absolutely. Right. right. Well, yeah, we run into it all the time. We, we did a book uh, on a guy named Bill Gothard, A Matter of Basic Principles, Bill Gothard and the Christian Life. And uh, uh, after it came out, there was a, a state senator in Arkansas that uh, had been an avid Gothard follower, he and his wife. Uh, and uh, uh, a judge gave him a copy of the book, and he called me, and he said, I need two cases of the book. Because many of his um, campaign workers were former Gothardite kids uh -huh. uh, that are now agnostic or atheists. And I said, yeah. okay, here's what you need to do. Start here. As you give in the book, say, just because God and Gothard both begin with G-O and end in D does not mean they're the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. Oh, and, and that's that's what I, I'll say to Latter-day Saints. I was talking to the, the three couples you were mentioning, and uh, and I was talking to one of the ladies, and she left, she said, because of the LGBTQ plus issue. That was why she left. I think it's a bad reason to leave a church. Sure. I think you ought to leave because it's not true, not just because you don't agree with its politics. But that was, uh, um, I, I asked her, would she be willing to consider uh, Christianity because she called herself an atheist? She said, yeah, I would be willing to consider it. Uh, I said, well, would you be willing to read the Bible? She said, I have a Bible. I said, King James? Yeah. I said, well, what if I gave you a modern translation? I, I invite you to have the King James open, but have that and read the book of John. Read the book of Romans and just ask yourself. Read it like a little child, as my friend Micah Wilder likes to say, and uh, and see if if there's some kind. I mean, it's a beautiful story. And, and, and she agreed to take it. And in fact, she ends up buying a book by Norm Geisler and Frank Turek. I don't have enough faith to be an, atheist. be an atheist. We carry that. We, we carry that in our bookstore. And she said, I'd like to, she says, you're right. I am going to, t I'm going to test this out because it would be wrong for me just to become an atheist without at least looking at the other side. So right. I think that's what we have as Christians is, in saying, uh, if it's possible, would you be interested and uh, I'll have a lot of Latter-day Saints say, no, I would not be interested because religion burned me. And I'll say, let me ask you this question. Religion burn you. Religion is made by man. So, so uh, Joseph Smith and Russell M. Nelson, the president of the church today, they burned you. And, and I, I, I get that. But what right. did God do to you? What did Jesus do, ever do to you to burn you? And right. they really can't point to anything except why did he let me be in this church for 35 right years. i said well right. i i can't help that but is it possible maybe that was the only way that you might come to the lord i, I you know i i don't want to quote flippantly romans 8 28 but i believe all things do come together right. for the good right. of those who love the lord if you really love god as a, if you if you believe you love god as a latter-day saint Maybe it would be great for you to read the Bible and find the truth and have a relationship with the true God, because I promise you, he will change your life radically for the rest of your life. And I have a lot. I'm not a former Latter-day Saint, but I have lots of people that if you'd like to talk to, I'd love to put you in touch with them so they could tell you their testimony. Sure, sure. I'm intrigued by the title of your next chapter, because when I see it, I think of a book that came out like. 20 years ago or more, how wide the divide. And when I think about, and of course it was about the divide between Mormonism and I think particularly evangelical Christianity. Um, when I think about that divide, I can think of nothing wider 
Yeah. But then this topic, who is God? It it boggles my mind that an evangelical scholar would have affixed his name to a book that comes out at the end minimizing how wide the divide is when you just look at this one area. Can you talk about that for us? Yeah. I mean, we are talking uh, polar opposites when it comes to the nature of God. In Mormonism, there's a, a couplet put together by Lorenzo Snow, the fifth president of the church. He put this together in 1840 and shared it with Joseph Smith, who called it doctrine. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may be. Earlier, I was sharing a little bit about God once being a human being in another realm. I mean, whoa, and then that he, he somehow sinned to die? I mean, that doesn't make any sense in the biblical uh, notion of, of who God is, that God is from everlasting to everlasting, Psalm 90, verse 2, which coincides with Mosiah 3, 5 and Moroni 8, 18, both verses in the Book of Mormon. In Joseph Smith's early days, agree that God has always been God from everlasting to everlasting. The idea that, that uh, God doesn't know of any other gods, and that no God exists at all. I mean, you can call anything you want a God. You can call a wooden uh, idol a, a God, but it doesn't make it a true God. The Bible is just replete with, with information to tell us that's not the kind of God that Mormonism teaches. The idea that God had worshipped a previous God, that that God had worshipped a previous God, an infinite right. regress going to no, who knows where, which makes no sense at all, when you consider the uh, illogical nature of eternal matter, uh, it's not possible that, uh, I wanna know if Mormonism is true, I wanna know who the first God was, but they can't right. tell you because there's no information on that. And then the idea that I can become as God, as, may, as God is, man may be, the, the, that is not true either. So the idea that God has a body of flesh and bones, Doctrine and Covenant, section 130, verse 22, the idea that I have the potential to become as God is so opposite of a God who has always been God, who's the only one who is omniscient, omniscient, omnipotent. Spencer W. Kimball in The Miracle of Forgiveness says that when we get exalted, we'll actually be able to be omniscient and omnipotent. I say balderdash because how can you have multiple omnipotent beings i say challenge the two omnipotent beings in an arm wrestling match and see who <laughs> somebody's got to win so one of them can't be i cannot be as god and they'll say well you're not going to become god the father you're just going to become your own god i don't care i mean it's like they, they like to say it's being on a uh on an uh, escalator and he's up here he'll always be ahead of you but you get on down here and you keep moving up that still doesn't make any biblical sense that there's only one God, the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is Achad, Deuteronomy 6 4. Does not, the Mormon has to retranslate that. It's not one God in essence, it's one God in purpose. So that's why you have to be very careful when you're talking to Latter day Saints and understanding what they're talking about. And it's one of the reasons, guys, I, in my book, in the appendix, I had to fight the publisher a little bit for this because in the, I wanted to put a glossary in there that would explain some of the unique terms because yeah. not everybody's going to know all of the terms. And so I have terms like adoption, agnosticism anthropomorphism, apocrypha. I have words like that that I, divide, uh, that I define in maybe a sentence or two. But I also have uh, words in there that we share with the Latter-day Saint and I distinguish between the two. Let me give you one, grace, according to the Christian idea in one sentence. Try to make a definition in one sentence, it's hard. Unmerited favor from God provided to those who place their trust in Jesus. That's as simple as I can get. That's what grace is. God's riches at Christ's expense. Receive, um, uh, getting something I don't deserve is how it's been explained. But the LDS, enabling power provided by God to help a person keep the commandments. You see the opposite on that? I mean, uh, so, so we have one where it says unmerited. Absolutely. Well, isn't that what religion does, though? Uh, re yeah. re religion, what it does is it tells you, here's what you have to do. The the Muslim, he says, well, I have the five pillars of faith. I'm going to have to you know, pray five times a day. I'm going to have to do this, that, the other. They know what they're supposed to do. People like a list. The Mormons, they like a list too. I just need to check these things off. 
what do I do for God is the question they're asking, as if there's anything you can do for God. But Christianity asks the much different question, what did God do for me? And when you understand that, I think it makes all the difference in the world. So I don't want to worship any old God. If you have the wrong God, then all the other doctrines are going to fall like dominoes. And I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to state it very clearly, Mormonism denies or distorts every fundamental teaching of the historic Christian church. Everything. It's the nature of scripture, the nature of God, yep. the nature of Jesus and uh, the person of Christ, salvation. Right. Uh, eschatology. It doesn't leave everything. anything untouched. Right. Well, and, and, and sometimes it starts with just a simple change. Um, I just I spoke on this this past Sunday. Nearly every false teacher starts with a simple change, one doctrine. Mm. But when they change that one doctrine, it starts affecting other ones down the line. And so you end up losing all of them eventually. So, uh, well, Grace, let's take Grace. Uh, the, what you quoted uh, could come out of Roman Catholicism. It could come out of Bill Gothard. In fact, that is his definition. Grace is got, giving you the power and ability to do his will joyfully. And so then what happens is you have this stuff called grace. It's stored somewhere. And you do enough good works to get more stuff called grace that gives you enables, enables you to do more good works to get more stuff called grace. Well, that starts impacting other aspects of the faith. Absolutely. It, it, right? It's really, a, you said it's a simple change. You know, really, it's, it's so subtle because it replaces what grace does with what grace, for what grace is. Yes. Right. And if you if you start focusing on what grace does, then you're going what you're going to lose is the fact that behind grace is is a a totally predisposed attitude of love and favor to his the objects the objects of God's grace, the sinners whom he is saving. Right. So, yeah. Well, like 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 Ron Ron has said and we uh, use this in our book, grace is a kindly attitude toward the undeserving. It is God's kindly attitude toward us, the undeserving. Mm -hmm. Shorthand is unmerited favor. That's true. But at a deeper level, it's God's attitude toward us. Right. That is communicating. It has nothing to do with stuff that we're going to get in order to please God because we can't please God. So like if you were to take the word love, you know, and if you were to talk, if you say, you know, uh, or, okay, happiness. Happiness is two kinds of ice cream, catching a butterfly, setting it free. I mean, that's a song from Peanuts, right? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what happiness does, you know, or that, or that's happiness enjoys those things. Happiness, uh, you know, causes you to do things that maybe make other people happy to be kind to others, but that's not what happiness is. Yeah. You know, love, yeah. Uh, they used to say, love is never having to say you're sorry. Um, well, I, what did that ever mean? That was from Love Story. I, maybe, <laughs> exactly. it's, maybe it's something like, if I really love you, I'm never going to hurt your feelings. Or maybe if I, if you really love me, you'll never ask me to say I'm sorry. I'm not really sure what it meant. But uh, whatever it means, it's not what love is. Right. Uh, it's right. something really nice associated with love, but it's not what love is. All right, so we're talking with Eric Johnson, his book, Introducing Christianity to Mormons, and the link uh, is in the description if you want to go and uh, get a copy of it. We recommend you do that. Next chapter, let's look at the next chapter. We still have some time left. Jesus, uh, uh, and that Savior. would be Jesus, Savior of his people. Tell us what you're talking about. Jesus, Savior of his people. What are you trying to convey there? Well, I want to show the Latter-day Saint that because uh, that would be something that uh, people will say. Well, do you believe in Jesus to the Latter Day Saint? And they're going to say, of course. Look at the look. Look at my badge, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter Day Saints. But the Bible says in Second Corinthians eleven four, it's possible to have a false Jesus. I mean, Muslims believe in Jesus. He's one of the seven greatest uh, prophets. Peace be upon him. They'll say, and yet Jesus was not just a prophet. He was a prophet. But he wasn't just a prophet, as as a Latter-day Saint would say. And also, 
they would say that Muhammad is the greatest of them all. Uh, the idea that Jesus is a good guru. I've talked to Hare Krishna devotees. They certainly have a place for Jesus, and so does the Mormon. They certainly have a place for Jesus as a created being of Heavenly Father, but he's not one to be prayed to. He's not one to have a personal relationship in the way that the Christian believes that it's possible to have. And so I want to show, using the Bible, the idea of the hypostatic union. And I talk about that. I use some terms in there, but I do define them in the glossary. Hypostatic union, Jesus is 100% God, 100% man. He never lost his deity. Uh, Jesus being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. The kenosis, he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. So we have the idea that this is the God man who John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The word became flesh, verse 14 says, and dwelt among us. And that's who I want to proclaim to the Latter-day Saint, because if you have a false view of Jesus, as the as Latter-day Saints do, Jehovah's Witnesses certainly do, the Muslim and the Hare Krishna, their view is short. If they don't have that correct view, then just like the idea of the nature of God, not having a correct idea of that, it's all going to blow up. And that does mm. ha happen because Mormonism denies the Trinity, for instance, another important teaching that co comes later in the book. So, yeah, that's what that's what I'm trying to do is explain the person of Jesus and uh, and try to correct uh, misconceptions because Latter-day Saints have different ideas of what we do with Jesus. But we believe Jesus is the God man. You know, it's, it's interesting. It just occurred to me when you're quoting John 1, 14. The word became flesh, which is actually the opposite of what Mormonism teaches. In their view, he became flesh to become the word. Yeah. He became the flesh to become God. Yeah. So John is reversing and he says, no, he was God who became human, yeah. incarnated. So just that one passage there refutes Mormonism. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think you're right. And um, I, there's so many verses that Latter-day Saints just don't really comprehend. One of the favorite books of the Bible, I like to have Latter-day Saint read. If they say, where do I start if I'm going to read the Bible in a modern translation? And I say, why don't you start with the book of John? It will tell you a story about who Jesus really was. I mean, very powerful. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And I believe that's a true relationship because if people uh, had a false version of Jesus, as 2 Corinthians 11, 4 says, then it's like having no Jesus at all. It does you no good. It, it, it's, it's a complete caricature of who he was. Jesus, according to Mormonism, he's a spirit brother of Lucifer. He was created at some point when they're not exactly sure, but he did create the world, they'll say, but he wasn't around when Heavenly Father was nearest the star Kolob on his world. God, yeah. uh, Jesus came in. And how did Jesus get to become a god when he didn't have to go through a mortality like you and i do nobody ever explains that one because that, that's uh that's something that just assume well he just uh, he where did he have the, such a goodness that he he could be perfect like that and uh, yet jesus uh there's very little known about jesus what happens to him in the next life except he's going to be with all of us somehow in each of our kingdoms and and yet they can't really explain that very well yeah. every time it's called star Coleb. Something like the that. nearest the star Kolob is how some of the earlier leaders taught. That's not in the scriptures at all. That could be considered speculation, I suppose. Yes. But they're, they don't know much about that first part of the couplet, as man is, God once was. As God once was, they say, we don't really know much about it, which I find interesting because they really want to put God in a box and they want to present him to you. And yet there's a lot about their, their religion that's a mystery. Who was yeah. the first God, you can ask them. I don't know. It's a mystery. Okay. <laughs> And that's when we get to the Trinity. Well, that's a Trinity is a mystery too because God's transcendent; He's above our thoughts. Makes me wonder if the if the writers of Star Trek were had, had a Mormon background because Stovo Kor sounds like Star Cola in reverse to me. Stovo Kor oh. is, is the Klingon version of heaven. Uh, so, 
Well, and you know, Spencer W. Kimball, many believe if you look at his picture and put it next to Yoda, he very much <laughs> looked like Yoda. And and what does Yoda say? Something about trying? How does he? I'm not no, a Star Trek fan. Don't, uh, don't, says, don't try, there, do. No, there is and no that's try, exactly no what Spencer Kimball would say. He was Nike before there was Nike. Just do it, he said. There is so, no try. There was only yeah, do. That's don't it. Try, and, do. And, so I, I would uh, not know, be surprised if they did use him for that. A couple things. Uh, you include a number of charts in here, which is really helpful, comparing Christianity and giving biblical references to Mormonism giving biblical references. One yeah, of the I things that, that yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, I, I do that, especially in the first couple of chapters. Uh, who is uh, God? Uh, who, Jesus, those cha those couple of chapters, I put a lot of time in because I don't want to get too deep into what Mormonism is. This is not a book. If you're wanting to understand Mormonism, I, I would consider our book Mormonism 101. Bill McKeever and I wrote that in 2015 with Baker. But I did want to do those charts real fast so that you could kind of get an idea of those differences. Well, and here's, here's why they're important uh, to me. Here's why they're important. Too many Christians, and, and I, I, I'm sure you've seen some of this, the polls and surveys and whatever, 6% of the population has a biblical worldview. 49% mm -hmm. uh, of the pastors in the pulpit have a biblical worldview. That tells me there's a lot of Christians out there who may have a heart for the gospel, but are not biblically literate. Uh, and sometimes it's easier. For Joy and I, we learned most about doctrine, really, studying Jehovah's Witnesses and comparing it to what we're supposed to believe. Right. Yep. That's what this does, in a sense. Oh, yeah, and, and I agree with you. I think by studying other religions, you really do learn more about what we believe and understand what is true orthodoxy versus what is just uh, what, what can be considered a heresy. But I'm going to say... A shame, we should be ashamed of ourselves as Christians because we do not know what we believe in the churches. And if you took that poll that you mentioned, 6%, if you did that poll in your church, what do you think the numbers would be with a biblical worldview? I'm shocked sometimes when people say mm. what, what is true. And, and I say, where did you get that from? Well, yeah. isn't, that what, isn't that what Christianity teaches? Uh, people are not willing to do the work themselves. I mean, how many of the believers in our church are, have ever read a systematic theology book? You know, I mean, and well, I realize that's a big endeavor, but they have miniature versions of these. And this is what this is kind of, ho I'm hoping that this will be instructional right. for people who may want to share their faith with Mormons, but don't want to be teaching them heresy. What is it that Christianity teaches? I'm dealing with the essential issues, not the peripheral issues we can yeah. have in-house debates on. You know what? You raise a good question, uh, and I think my response is this: You learn about what you are genuinely interested in. Mm -hmm. Now, you have believers who are believers who are not well trained. There's some assumption that if I go and do my Sunday morning thing and maybe a little more, I'm going to have sufficient information to live out my Christian life. But we learn most of what we learn by osmosis. It comes in through the books we read, the films we watch, the movies we watch, the uh, radio shows we listen to. It all saturates in there and sort of becomes part of our worldview, unchecked, which is a key word. Few churches even offer the kinds of things you're talking about. My home church does. We have what we call Wonder Lake Bible Institute. It's about six years going through all of those kinds of things. The pastor teaches verse by verse through the Bible. Uh, he covers a lot of other material, but also defense of the faith stuff comes into, depending on what's going on in the chapter. The church I'm interim pastoring, we just finished, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist on midweek. We're starting tactics in September. Great. Great. Uh, Ron is Presbyterian. They do catechisms. Right. So there are resources yeah. available. Churches it, need to make use of those. Not only, it, it, I keep coming back to this phrase, embarrassment of riches. Um, yes. It's a phrase that was the title of a French play back in the 1600s from a playwright who it, it became utterly obscure. The play itself didn't go anywhere. The career of the playwright didn't go anywhere. But that name stuck. The embarrassment of riches that's stuck in our culture. It's unbelievable. It is unfathomably unbelievable how different it is to be a researcher in 2022 as compared to 1992 when I was right. kind of launching into my MA program at Wheaton. 
um, you know, if I wanted to access the ATLA religion database, I had to go to the Buswell Library or the Billy Graham Center Library. Right. And and it was difficult. I mean, I had to log it. I had to. It was text based. It was you know, it was cumbersome. You had to learn the the inter, the interface. I do it from this desktop right now yeah. as an alumnus of the school. You know, uh, and I'm I just I probably I could do two or three searches in the middle of this program on different uh, journal articles that I'm looking for. And sometimes uh, do. <laughs> and I sometimes do. So you know, I I can find I have found books in. English from the 1500s on Google Books. Isn't that great? That are significant for what I'm looking for. Yeah. Going back to the 1500s. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's not like there's anything you can. You, there's nothing that you can't find, but the the amount of time we save, we have this. Each one of us has this at our fingertips 24/7 most of the time, unless your internet goes down. And if you don't have it 24-7, you might have a subscription to Logos or some other amazing software package that will give you much of what I just uh, referred right. to. Right. And we don't right. use so, it. So here's, here's, here's a challenge that I, I'm going to put out there. Pastors, pray for your congregation that God will bring somebody into each of their lives that they cannot see not being in heaven. Once they have a love for that person, there is no amount of money they won't spend, time they won't invest, or books they won't read to figure out how do I talk to them. That's number one. Number two, as believers, you need to pray that God will bring somebody into your life that you just fall in love with, that you want to reach with the gospel. Once that happens, again, there's nothing you won't do to reach them. And a tool for Mormons, in this case, mm -hmm. And it's applicable in other areas. It just happens this is to Mormonism. Is uh, is this book introducing Christianity to Mormons by Eric Johnson? It's a really good book. It'll give you all the essentials of the Christian faith that's helpful to you in talking to Mormons and others, atheists even. Yeah. <clears throat> Ron, would you care to waltz us out of here? I would certainly care to do that. Let's give credit to whom credit is due. Our resident cult leader profiler is Neil before me. Our wardrobe manager is See How It Fits You. Culinary services are provided by Chef Ham and Cheese. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is Just In Case. Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon. And D Opposer, our Mormon Archives manager, is Polly Gummus. Our Liberal Denominations Bureau Chief is Lucy Gosey. Our transgender issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Special correspondent for cults based on the Hindenburg disa uh, disaster and flying turkeys. Oh, to humanity. Our fact checking supervisor is Joel Pulling. Uh, technical assistance comes through Murky Research. Legal advisors at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Grievance resolution director is Giovanna Pisami. Director of privacy assurance is why you're tapping. And original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for this content, although you will never be able to prove that in a court of law. Never, never, never. Where do you keep all those people? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not now that you can do everything virtually, you know. So you can virtually keep them. We do the Royal Wave and we do the end 